Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Practical Farmers of Iowa Winter Farm in Our Series. Uh, this is a second in our series that's covering the topic of small grains. Tonight, the topic of our discussion is oats for Iowa, variety selection and agronomic production tips. We have Darren Fair, uh, an Iowa farmer with a lot of experience uh, growing oats, and Bruce Rotkins, Roskins uh, was with grain millers. Um, Today we're really going to hone in on this idea of uh, variety selection and uh, you know planning from planning for success from the start uh, before the grain is ever out of the bag. Tell you just a little bit about PFI uh, before we get started here. Uh, give everyone a chance to enter in their location and email address in the chat box, and also uh, fill out the poll I've got going on the right side of the screen uh, to determine how many people are watching. So. Uh, PFI has been around since 1985, and we really pride ourselves on being uh, farmer-led. And uh, what that means is, you know, we our programming is determined on topics that that farmers want. Uh, we do on-farm research based on uh, a consortium of our co-op cooperators, um, and so we really we fo we're focused on uh, strengthening farms and sharing the information am, uh, amongst the farmers. Uh, this Farm and Arts Night is a big part of how we uh, hope to share information. Everyone is welcome at Practical Farmers of Iowa, and a lot of our uh, programming and activities are free to the public, such as this uh, Farm and Arts series. And uh, we also really pride ourselves on that. 60% of the members, 60% of the people that come to our uh, field days aren't members, and we're glad to share the information uh, that our members hold uh, into the broader agricultural community. But if you find yourself constantly uh, looking into practical farmers information, searching our website, visiting our farm and ours uh, in our field days, we certainly do appreciate uh, your membership. Then um, the same way that members drive our decision making, uh, members are a big part of uh, what keeps us ticking under the hood. And so um, you can see on the screen here, it's pretty well priced, pretty fairly priced. Um, whole farm for $60, and that can include uh, multiple uh, families that are operating on the farm. So uh, priceless for a wealth of knowledge uh, that we provide. Um, here's our events calendar. Um, you know, February is maybe a little slower, um, but big Midwest cover crop conference coming up uh, the middle of the month. Um, we carry both our own programming and the programming of other like-minded folks. Uh, on our events calendar, so uh, please check in, especially as the field day season comes around in spring and summer. Uh, this will keep you up to date on what might be happening in your area. As I mentioned, this is the winter farm and our series. Uh, this February, we're really focusing on uh, small grain production and being successful with small grains. Uh, a lot of the farmers in our network that have diversified rotations that include small grains really tell us that it's one of sort of the key strategies for balancing uh, their productivity, their profitability, um, and environmental health. This quote comes from a recent uh, ISU study on the topic of a two and three year uh, rotation as compared to a two year corn and bean rotation. And, um, you know, really what they found is that adding the small grains can make a farmer less reliant on. Uh, Chemical and fossil fuel inputs can reduce the need of synthetic fertilizers, especially where uh, legume underseedings are used, and also sort of harnesses time and ecology uh, in order to disrupt pests and weeds um, that we otherwise have to treat with other uh, practices. And so it's also useful for uh, building healthy soils, just the variety of roots that come um, from small grains as compared to uh, you know, having a, a, the same crop every year in a field. The variety of roots really helps to build organic matter, uh, which is ultimately going to make a farm uh, more resilient to drought and flooding. Um, and I think we'll maybe hear a bit tonight uh, from Darren, but a lot of farmers also tell us they like small grains for uh, the fact that it sort of spreads out the workload through the season. You can get in, uh, work the small grains, uh, you know, for both planting and harvesting ahead of the corn and beans. And so if you're managing a lot of acres, uh, and, you know, it feels like every year there's smaller and smaller windows to get out in the field. Small grains can really help to uh, to even that out. And so because of that, PFI has been really focusing on uh, sort of what we've been calling uh, archiving the indigenous knowledge about small grains. A lot of uh, these grains, uh, oats primarily, have been grown on a lot of Iowa farms, but for many of them, 
uh, it's maybe been, you know, since grandpa's generation and sort of oats went, have gone to the wayside and were more focused on uh, corn and beans. And so we find uh, farmers coming to us and saying, you know, we, I'm interested in growing oats, but gosh, I really don't know uh, much about it. So over the last year, I've been trying to work with small grains, uh, farmers, and we're archiving that knowledge, so to speak, uh, through this farm in our series, other farm in ours that we've had on the topic, both last week and in our fall series, and then also um, through the farm press. So I would encourage you, if you're interested in these topics, uh, these have hyperlinks uh, you can look at in the ar archive. Uh, check out some of our work in the Organic Broadcaster and the Wallace's uh, Farmer. I should also mention, I passed over their logos, a lot of our small grain work um, has been funded by the Series Trust and the Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture. Um, and so I've said quite enough here, just a little bit of housekeeping as we uh, get started. Put your uh, location, the email in the chat box, please. It really helps us to track who's watching and, and how many people uh, are accessing this these farminars. The farminars are available, of course, live uh, as we are right now. And then also uh, they're archived and you can find Tomorrow, by tomorrow afternoon, you'll be able to find this one and others uh, on the website uh, back for several years. Uh, the chat box is where we'll ask questions. Everybody's finding that, it seems, through the uh, entering uh, names and such there. And then we're going to reserve the final 30 minutes of the session or 25 minutes or so for questions. So uh, feel free to type your questions into the chat box. And if Bruce and Darren find it, uh, it works into their presentation well. Um, they'll give you a holler, and if not, we'll definitely address those as we get to the end. Um, oh, and then finally, Sarah Carlson gave me one more slide here, and that's to point out that um, the topic of the conversation uh, tonight being variety selection is something that PFI has looked into uh, across the years. And so here's a study that we did in 2006 and 2007. Mainly, I wanted to give you the hyperlink, which I see now is cut off the screen. So... Um, I'm going to post this elsewhere on the screen tonight so you can get access to the one research report uh, PFI has has on this topic. Um, Bruce Roskins is from Grain Millers. It's going to be the first of our hosts tonight. Uh, but I am I do want to let Darren uh, just give a brief introduction of himself um, before we get started. Can you hear me okay, Drake? Okay, very okay. good. Yes. Welcome, Darren. Thank you. It's uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thankful to be with you tonight. Um, my name is Darren Fair. I live up uh, near Mallard, Iowa. Um, farm, or actually near a little town called Plover. Um, I've been farming since 1993. We've uh, switched to, to organic production in 1998, and I've been organic ever since. Um, my, we'll get into more details in terms of my rotations and stuff a little bit later, but. Uh, uh, have grown oats all through those years with, uh, you know, some good success and some not so good. Last year being one of those that was not very well. So uh, I still profess that I have a lot to learn. So I'm, I'm interested again to hear uh, Bruce's comments tonight. I think uh, he represents a, a wealth of information and is able to share that. But um, that's a little bit of my background. Um, looking forward to the evening. All right. Thanks very much, Darren. And now, uh, Bruce, I'll let you take it away okay Drake you can hear me okay okay very good uh, good evening ladies and gentlemen uh, thanks for the opportunity uh, my name is Bruce Roskins I've been with grain millers now about two and a half years and have spent uh, most of my career uh, working for uh, cereal and food company um, a lot of time in Iowa grew up on a family farm in Northwest Iowa and uh, yes, we raised oats on that farm. And uh, soon after I went to work for the Quaker Oats Company, my dad quit raising oats and stuff. Uh, of course, it had something to do, I guess, with uh, the fact that he retired from farming and stuff as well. Um, there's a, a lot of knowledge out there on oat production. Unfortunately, there's not a lot written about some of the oat production. Uh, you can't go to a seed company and get a guide or a recipe, if you will, uh, for profitable oat production like you can with uh, hybrid seed corn or seed beans or something like that. So a lot of the information is handed down, some of it's anecdotal, uh, from 
uh, <coughs> other farmers. Uh, in my experience, I've been able to see oat production and oat research and variety development around the world. And uh, I, I can be one of the first ones to tell you that what works in Canada doesn't always work in Iowa, and what works in Iowa doesn't always work in North Dakota or some other locations. Get rolling here with the slides. Uh, one of the main messages is regardless of what you think or you knew about oats 10 years ago or 15 years ago, these really are not your father's oats as far as the production uh, today, particularly in the Midwest like in Iowa. We've got a lot of factors, <coughs> excuse me, that have changed. Uh, we're using much heavier, larger tillage equipment. We're using larger planting equipment. Uh, the equipment width, the seed placement, the crop row width. Uh, a lot of people, uh, you get to be my age, you remember the end gate seeders and then disking the oats in or, or harrowing it in. Today everything is pretty much done with with uh, grain drills and uh, we still have a lot to learn about what's the appropriate row width. Uh, there's a lot of experimentation going on up in the prairies of Canada looking at not only uh, 9 inch but even 11 inch, inch row widths and there's a lot of things to be learned about that because oats react differently than barley or wheat or any other crop because of the way that the root system spreads out because of the way that the uh, the leaf structure is on the oats, you really need to marry up your equipment with the right variety. <clears throat> and that gets into the new varieties. Uh, a lot of the varieties today have more targeted usage, as I would call it. Depending upon the maturity of the oat, depending upon the leaf structure of the oat, depending upon the nutritional quality of the oats, whether they're a milling oat or a forage oat or a feed oat or with the big interest in the last couple of years oats is a cover crop and we'll get into that a little bit. Uh, new cropping patterns and fertility needs, the rotations. Uh, I threw canola on this just because as you go further north, uh, particularly North Dakota, you're seeing a lot of interest today of uh, canola production along with soybeans. Uh, it takes a little bit different rotation strategy to, to put oats into a rotation with a crop like canola that's a heavy phosphorus and sulfur user. The plant disease pressure, and I assume, Darren, that's probably part of the problem that you had this last year. Uh, Mother Nature changes the mix of the rusts we have every year. And last year we had some new strains of crown rust or leaf rust come on board and it really hurt Iowa and uh, portions of southern Minnesota. It skipped over South Dakota, it hit North Dakota very badly, and then we saw some rust up into Manitoba even. Uh, harvesting and storage, um, just producing the crop isn't good enough. We really have to look at the way that we harvest the oats and store the oats. Again, uh, back when dad was doing it or grandpa was doing it, they swathed the oats, uh, they left it lay, uh, the old rule of thumb was when you thought that the oats were ready to go, you went to the fair for three days and then you came back and swathed the oats. Uh, today everybody wants to take it straight cut and uh, there are shortcuts that can be done on that, but some of them that are not necessarily beneficial to the quality that you get. And of course today we have a lot more on-farm storage. Uh, oats store very well, but they have to be dry, they have to be in good condition, and we'll talk about that a little bit. The quality specs may have changed. Uh, today, uh, there's a lot of elevators in the Midwest, not just Iowa, but all over, that don't even want to bring oats in. They say they're too dusty. They say they don't have the bin space for them. Uh, they say they're too bulky. They don't want to handle them. Uh, I can tell you back in the start of my career in the mid-70s, uh, a lot of places took oats down to 32 pounds. That's really hard to find any uh, today. Uh, a lot of places are looking for minimums that they can go to the millers with, and generally speaking, that's about a 36-pound oat. <clears throat> and then whatever your beliefs are on climate change, yes, it affects small grain production. Uh, as we look at some of the variability that we've seen in the summertime temperatures, as we look at uh, planting time, harvesting time, 
uh, that all affects some of our choices on the varieties as we go forward. <clears throat> this map shows kind of a historical region where a lot of milling quality oats, what the uh, millers like Quaker and General Mills and grain millers uh, are looking for. Uh, Iowa at one point in time was one of the largest oat production states in the nation back in the 1950s and that's kind of uh, phased out obviously with corn and soy. Uh, we still have uh, a pocket of oats uh, in southeast Minnesota, northeast Iowa, southwest Wisconsin and generally speaking they're some of the best yields uh, available in those areas. Central Illinois has a small pocket of, of oat production with uh, some uh, livestock producers and also some organic folks in that area. But the majority of the oats that are coming to the millers in the U.S. today are coming out of either the uh, prairie areas, Manitoba and Saskatchewan, and a little bit of Alberta, or out of the Dakotas. And uh, we're really trying to see what we can do as a company to try to revitalize oats as a profitable crop uh, back into the states. When I started with uh, in my career in, in oat production there was 585 million bushel of oats produced in the United States in uh, 1975. Today there's less than 80 million so we've lost uh, most of the oat production from the US as we've seen corn and bean yields uh, more than double in a lot of the production areas and of course oats with out having the benefit of any commercial seed production, uh, any seed companies get on board with it. The fact that it's not a hybrid crop, we haven't seen those kind of yield gains. So, uh, just like with any profitable uh, production today, profitable oats production takes a strategy. It includes a crop rotation strategy. Uh, there is not such a thing as an oat farmer. There's a farmer that looks at oats in crop rotation and how does it fit into his strategy for total farm production. It requires field selection. Unfortunately, part of the reason we see lower yields in oats is the fact that it gets put on the crappiest ground. A lot of times I'll refer to oats as the Rodney Danger field of crops because it gets no respect. It gets put in maybe last uh, after some of the other small grains or after corn or I got that wet spot down there I will throw a little bit of oats in it or gee I wanted to like to get a little more pasture over in that area so I'll throw some oats down with uh, a legume or, or uh, another grass and then they wonder why the oat yields aren't there. Variety selection, we'll go into that a little bit more in depth, but you really do need to study some of the fact sheets from the universities and from some of the seed companies about the differences in these varieties. They do vary in disease reaction. <coughs> Excuse me, they do vary in uh, the way that they react under stress. They do vary in maturity. Uh, weed control strategy, the good news is oats are very tolerant to most of the broadleaf weed sprays like dicambas, uh, 2,4-D, as long as you use an amine formulation. But the biggest problem we've got is farmers wait too long until the oats are uh, fourth or fifth leaf or uh, all, all the way to heading and by that time it's a little bit too late. Harvesting and storage strategy and then a marketing strategy. Uh, we did a study a few years ago when I was with my previous employer about uh, when does a farmer typically market his oats. Well over 75 percent of the farmers were marketing the oats right off the combine. When do you think the lowest price is? Huh, right after combining, you know, right at harvest time. So you really need to see how oat production fits into your marketing strategy as well. So on field selection. Obviously you want to choose a field that's relatively free of wild oats, which we don't have too big of a problem with in Iowa, fortunately, and minimal herbicide residue carryover. Uh, today with most of the uh, herbicides that are used in corn and soybeans, uh, Liberty or, uh, or Roundup or, or glyphosates, there's no residue uh, problem with most of those. But when you get into some of the other uh, heavier, longer term herbicides such as Pursuit, uh, those crops or those herbicides can affect oats 
uh, if you uh, have over applied or have a spot where maybe it got double applied. Oats are a very desirable rotational crop with canola, soybeans, or legumes. They are a deep rooted crop, uh, deeper rooted than wheat, deeper rooted than uh, barley. They can withstand uh, wetter soils and colder soils than either wheat or barley. So it, our rule of thumb is always to try to get the crop planted as early as possible. Uh, we've got farmers in the Dakotas that are planting oats right into the frost. Uh, they are using an inoculant or some uh, protectant, some uh, fumigants and stuff with that uh, to try to control some of the uh, cold uh, effects on, on the oats, but it's working quite well. Uh, it's best not to rotate cereals back to back with the exception of oats. We do have farmers that are putting oats back to back and they're getting along okay with that. But if you're uh, rotating it with wheat or barley or another small grain of some sort, uh, there can be some trash effects from the straw from the previous year and it, it just seems that after a year or two you cannot get the yield potential out of those varieties. Again, oats can tolerate cooler, wetter soils better than many other cereal crops. And a good viable seed oat will germinate well at 45 degrees. Seeding oats, we really do recommend the use of certified seed uh, or maybe a year off of certified. There's not a lot of good data out there today that I can cite that shows the, the return per acre of certified seed. But if you talk to a certified seed uh, producer, talk to farmers that are routinely buying it, they do it and they see the benefit of it. Uh, a few years ago I was up in Quebec where a farmer is required to use certified seed every year and they just scratch their head up there and wonder why the rest of the world hasn't caught on to the benefits of, of certified seed not only from the germination standpoint or the cleanliness, but the viability of the seed, how much quicker the uh, seed uh, germinates and then has a strong, healthy plant. Uh, if you're not organic, we do encourage the use of uh, fungicides for smut control or a variety that does have good smut resistance and, that, and the varieties will vary with that to a degree. Oats have responded very well to some of the bacterial-based inoculants. Again, planting as early as possible, mid-March to uh, early May up into North Dakota. Uh, mid-March, uh, I know there's a lot of times in northwest Iowa that you're either dodging snowbanks yet in, in March or you can get the oats seeded. As soon as that ground is dry enough, go ahead and get it in there. And I, I, I did actually take that picture that's on this slide uh, up in uh, Canada where a farmer thought the ground was uh, dry enough but he got out there across the field and just kind of sunk it away a little bit. That's a little bit too early. The rate, two and a half to three and a half bushel per acre. I like the seed oats fairly heavy. I think you get a better ground cover. I think you do a better job of, of uh, shading the soil to reduce some of the seed uh, or so, excuse me some of the weed pressure. Uh, again your goal is to try to get a minimum of 18 and maybe 23 to 25 plants per square foot for a final stand. Here's a formula that you can use uh, to figure out your seeding rate depending upon the germination of your seed and the seed size. Obviously some of the varieties are smaller seeded. A few of the uh, early ones like TAC, uh, a couple of the other ones from Illinois have a little bit smaller seed to start with versus some of the North Dakota lines. So you really want to look at uh, the seeding rate based upon the size of the kernel and they refer to that as thousand kernel weight. So your seeding rate is the desired number of plants per square foot so if you're going to figure 23 times a thousand kernel weight of a, of a thousand kernels in grams times 10 divided by your expected seed survival and your seed survival is your uh, combination of the germination and the viability of that seed. Let's talk about oat morphology just a little bit. Uh, oat has a groat in the middle, the uh, center yellow portion. Uh, the germ down at the base and then there's the hull around it and there's actually 
two sets of holes on oats. This is uh, the oat groat if you cut it uh, diagonally, not diagonally, but uh, crossways across it. You can see that there's a crease down the middle just like there is in all small grain, but with oats it can be a little bit deeper. There's an outer hull around that uh, kernel after it's harvested called the lemma. And you can see sometimes, like up at the top of that uh, outer green circle, you can see some, some uh, black edging on there. That's an extension of that lemma. And oat varieties vary with the length of that lemma uh, and the cover of that lemma. Inside the lemma is the paleo. And that paleo can either be smooth or it can be very thick or very thin or it can adhere very uh, tightly to the lemma. This is some of the strategies that oat millers use looking at what varieties do we want. We've been encouraging and funding oat breeders uh, around the, the Midwest and around Canada to breed oats with a thinner hull, with a hull that comes off easier. So that's why there's certain varieties we really don't like. They're very, very hard to, to de-hull. And that's the first process we go through after we clean the oats. Varieties that grain millers are recommending, Badger, Colt, Saber, Spurs, Tack. You can see there's a lot of different names here. They're from the land-grant universities in the Midwest, uh, Wisconsin, South Dakota, uh, Illinois, Minnesota. I seem to have lost my screen here. I don't know what happened there. Let me try to pull it back up. There we're back. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened there. Are you still there, Bruce? Now I've got your presentation up, but I don't have volume coming from you. Bruce, sometimes I'm going to kick you out of the presentation format and then bring you back in and see if that sort of reboots your connection. All right, Bruce, are you back with us now? Darren, you can't hear Bruce either, right? It's not just me. Okay, can you hear me now? There we go. Oh, yes. Are we back on? Back, Bruce. Okay, I don't know what yes. happened. All of a sudden, I just lost screen and everything. So, okay, we'll see if we can continue on here then. Okay, the milling oat varieties that we're recommending for 2015, and again, you can see they vary by maturity to a degree. Uh, early uh, oats, uh, mid medium uh, maturity oats, and then later season oats. And again, depending upon your type of strategy, what you're looking for in your crop rotation system, uh, you need to take, to take a look at the maturity on it. Again, they do vary somewhat in some of the disease resistance. Uh, if this had been a year ago, we would have had an R there on crown rust or leaf rust on a lot more of the varieties. But again, with last year, with the crown rust seeming to change some uh, strains, uh, we've got uh, more of them that are susceptible. Stem rust is generally not a problem for us in the Midwest. It's a bigger problem as we get up into northern Minnesota and North Dakota. BYDV is barley yellow dwarf virus. And that's the yellowing that you will see in the plant that is not a nutritional problem, but a viral disease spread by aphids. The further south you go, for instance, Missouri for the southern areas uh, next to the Missouri border, 
uh, closer to Illinois, we have a more of a flush of aphids in the spring. And, you, and we will see the barley yellow dwarf virus brought in by those aphids who will eat on the leaves and inject the virus and you'll see some, some uh, yellowing of the bottom leaves and then eventually it turns into a red spiral and that's called red leaf or barley yellow dwarf virus. On hull color there's always a lot of debate you know what color will the people take or the millers take you know what we really don't care about the hull color at all we're interested in the color of the groat and is it clear and is it pure so you can have a yellow oat or a white oat or a tan colored oat uh, and it really doesn't bother us because we dehull the oats anyway. We're interested in the color of the of the hull, or excuse me, of the groat. So for those people that are interested, perhaps in the horse industry, there they want a white oat, not because it's more nutritious, but just that's what the trainers seem to want is a white oat. Okay, we'll talk about fertility moving along. Uh, Oats like fertilizer. They like nitrogen. Nitrogen is directly responsible for the yield, for the amount of growth that you get uh, in the plant. It determines uh, the number of tillers that you can get. It determines the protein of the oats. A pound of oat, excuse me, a bushel of oats takes a pound of nitrogen. Now I'm not saying that if you want to have 150 bushel oats, you put on 150 pounds of nitrogen. What I'm saying is that the plant in its root st structure needs to be able to have access to 150 pounds of nitrogen. Phosphate, P2O5, uh, <clears throat> is the element that is directly responsible for root growth, root depth, the uptake of the nitrogen through the root system, and the straw strength. A lot of farmers are afraid to put nitrogen on oats because they're afraid they're going to lodge. Yes, there's some varietal differences with that, but one of the biggest problems that we normally see is they've got too much nitrogen in ratio to the phosphate or the, pot, uh, the uh, P2O5 that they put on. Potassium, <coughs> excuse me, potassium is the element that is directly responsible for stress reaction with oats. If you look at the guard cells or the, the stomatal openings on the bottom of an oat leaf, the element that's primarily responsible for the opening and closing of those stoma during the day and during the night is potash or K2O, <coughs> the potassium in that. So if you have a plant that is short on potash, even though your soils may t test fairly high, if the plant doesn't isn't able to access the potassium, you will see it stress faster. It will uh, metabolize quicker the materials that are there. It will show more stress. Sulfur, we never thought that oats needed a lot of sulfur, but today in some of the higher production territories of corn, soy, and particularly canola, we have found a lot of fields that are a little bit deficient in sulfur. Oats likes sulfur. So we talk about uh, the need of about 15 pounds per acre in a well-drained soil. Uh, that's if you're using canola or, uh, for instance, a high production 200 bushel corn or whatever. Uh, you can cut that by about a third to about five pounds under normal Iowa conditions. <coughs> I draw your attention to the oats line here. Uh, if you're going in this particular chart, 100 bushel of oats, you need to have a minimum of 73 pounds of nitrogen, 27 pounds of P2O5, 18 pounds of K2O, uh, 4 pounds of um, uh, magnesium, and uh, 7 pounds of sulfur. <coughs> Excuse me, weed control. The best early weed control is, is a good heavy stand. Oats tolerate pre-plant glyphosate application for clean field operations for the conventional farmer. And we have seen some successes with early mechanical tillage for weed control. When the oats are just emerging, if, you're ha if you do have a spot out there that's uh, very grassy or it's got a lot of brome in it, uh, there's been some really good work 
using a uh, uh, tine toothed uh, dr uh, drag or arrow, uh, taking those spots out, and the oats seem to recuperate very, very well. Again, the good news is oats are very tolerant to most of the amine formulations of herbicides, the dicambus, the 2,4-Ds, the MCPAs. Uh, it all depends on the weed that you're trying to control. But again, stick with the amine formulations. If you go with an ester formulation, you will burn that crop and you will set it back. The other thing that you will notice uh, after the oats heads out, particularly if you hit it a little bit too late when that uh, panicle primordium is moving up through the maris, through the main stem, uh, you'll see a lot of blasting or yellowing of, of white condition of the bottom rows of kernels. Bad news is if you do have wild oats, and again, I don't think this is, applies to a lot of the Iowa farmers, but there's no good control other than early planting. We encourage broadleaf weed control at or before the fourth leaf stage. Uh, it's the most effective, it's the best yield potential, and it's the lowest, crop of, uh, lowest risk of crop injury. You have to remember that up until the crop is in the fourth leaf stage, the growing point is down at the ground level. So you can freeze that oat, you can drive over it, you can burn it with a herbicide, and that growing point hasn't been damaged yet. But from the fourth leaf stage on, that growing point is starting to move up through the stem, and anything you do to it at that point in time can damage that developing panicle primordium. Hey, hey, Bruce, this is Drake at PFI. Sorry to interrupt. I think we're having some trouble with the synced, with the, the PowerPoint is not synced. Um, and so I wanted to make sure, which slide are you on? And I'll try to keep better track now, and I can advance ahead if something's not I'm on the right. one called weed uh, control for some reason. There we go. Now I'm back to, to uh, full screen. And this is what you want to be on. Here's the one I, I was on that I was just finishing on weed control. And, and that's the one that you want to be on? Yep. And now we'll, sw now we'll okay. switch to the plant disease control. Is that the one that everyone's looking at? Great. I think I just brought us up to speed, but for a while they were hung up there. Yep, and now you see that control. So thank you very much. No, I, I'm, I appreciate it because people are probably more confused than normal then. Um, Bruce, there are some questions. Bruce, there are some questions down here in the lower corner. I didn't know if you wanted to address them. Uh, sure. Let's take them as we see them here. Josh had a question regarding uh, hog manure. Yeah, uh, oats react. Oats can react very well to hog manure, providing that, uh, depending upon how you've incorporated, how much you put it in, lodging can be an issue. Again, if you don't have enough phosphorus there uh, to keep the, the plant growing, I don't like to see hog manure applied after the crop is already up and going. That's, a, that's not an uncommon practice in some areas, when, again, because the oats growing point is, is still at ground level or below at the fourth, fourth leaf stage, that farmers will go out there and top dress a little bit. I will guarantee you, you will see some lodging, you will see some burning, particularly with hog manure because of the higher nitrogen content in it. So. Can you apply it pre-plant? Can you apply it, uh, you know, uh, in the fall? Yes, you can. Uh, just make sure that your phosphorus level is high enough. Okay, moving on, uh, disease controls. This one's a tough one this year. Uh, crown rust or leaf rust is our primary disease, and you can see how it, it uh, the pustules are there. Um, Stem rust, again, will look the same, only a little darker red on the stems of the plant. Barley yellow dwarf or BYDV or red leaf, again, starts out with the bottom leaves showing a little bit of yellowing, uh, particularly along the edges of the leaves. And then eventually the leaves uh, die and they will turn a dark red and they will get a twist to them. And that's how you can tell that it's not a fertilizer deficiency or herbicide. It's, it's viral. And at that point in time, unfortunately, there's nothing you can do. <clears throat> if we have a cool spring followed by some warm weather with a lot of uh, aphids uh, out there, then there's always a chance for it. And some of the 
uh, insecticides have worked. Some of the same ones that are used in winter wheat, they've done a very good job, but the timing has to be very accurate. And for the most part, uh, we haven't seen a tremendous amount of success with farmers using it. So we encourage you to use a variety that has very good barley yellow dwarf tolerance or resistance to it. Septoria is a uh, black moldy looking uh, lesion on the leaf. Uh, it can happen in a cool wet spring, in a cool wet summer. Not a lot you can do for it. Uh, some of the fungicides do work fairly well that control the crown rust and the stem rust as well. It will help with septoria, but it's more of a saprophytic type uh, disease that goes after some of the dead tissue on the uh, oat leaf itself. Fusarium, five years ago we would have told you that oats are resistant to fusarium. We know that's no longer the case. Why? Because we have so much fusarium in our soils today and in our environment from all of the corn, corn on corn, more corn, uh, the same fusarium that attacks the corn uh, will also attack the small grains. Uh, we do not see the effect on the uh, oat head like you will see with wheat or barley. Those tighter compact heads, you will see more of the salmon colored kernels, more of the uh, death of the, uh, the, the kernels in that tight head. And then, of course, the Don or vomitoxin forming from that. The last few years, we've seen an occasional kernel of oats, the, particularly the bottom row of kernels of that uh, panicle, that will have uh, or can have one or two kernels that appear to have had some fusarium. The good news is that the fusarium generally stays on that outer hull, the gloom, uh, as it's referred to, that gets taken off in the harvesting process, so we don't see too big of a problem with fusarium. <clears throat> Excuse me. The fungicides do work well on oats. They've been shown to boost yields. There's a lot of anecdotal stories out there about uh, oat yields that are 5 to 10 percent better with the application of a fungicide. We're not really sure the entire mechanism on that. Is it because the fungicide actually delays the maturity does just slow down the metabolism of the plant or has it allowed the plant to get rid of a stress and allow it to grow and fill a little better. Uh, we did see this last year farmers that did use a fungicide in Iowa and southern Minnesota that they got it on in a timely fashion still had milling quality oats and had better test weight and uh, better standability of that crop. There are several fungicides approved. Uh, Stratego, which is a combination of both the propiconazoles as well as the strobilins. Tilt, uh, which is a propiconazole. Headline, uh, it, headline is used a lot on corn and conventional uh, corn production. You can use it. It's a little bit hotter uh, chemical than the tilt or the Stratego is. Stratego, because it's got uh, two active ingredients in it, seems to have a little longer effect on it. Uh, headline is more of a hit at once, and uh, uh, it can do a little bit of damage in that time period, and then you move on. Um, for the organic producer, I, I wish there was a lot more data out there. Uh, we're looking at some of the biological controls. We're hearing some stories that some of the biological controls uh, are working for crown rust. Um, we don't know anything about how they're working with some of the other, the stem rust or fusariums, but uh, it's our intent to do a little more testing of that this coming year to see if we can't find some good, solid biological controls that can be applied in a timely manner to control some of the disease pressures. Harvesting and storage. Um, <clears throat> I still like swathing oats. Uh, I may be old school, but I think, you know, if you can target, if you're going to swath, if you have that opportunity, you have the, the chance of, if you still got some uh, green stems, uh, you got to remember that oats acts differently than barley or wheat. 
wheat and barley dry from the bottom up so your stem gets weak and you can still have a wet kernel at the top therefore that's why you see a little more of the fusarium type diseases in the heads oats dries from the top down <clears throat> you also have to remember that the oat head itself is what's called a panicle type inflorescence 90 percent of the yield in an oat head is in the bottom two-thirds of that head so as it dries from the top down you will see those that top kernel or the top row of kernels that those glooms will open up they'll be white uh, they they dry very quickly you may see the birds attack those right at the top and you can still have the bottom half or more of that head still be in the 20 percent moisture range it's physiologically mature it's not going to pack any more nutrients in at that point in time it may not pack in any more test weight at that point in time but if you go out there too early and try to combine those oats at that point or even swath them you could suffer a little bit with test weight so we say try to have the oats you know in the low 20s if you're going to swath it the greenest kernels have just turned to a cream color and uh, again you don't want to have the holes be uh, green at that point in time you want them turning a little bit now the big question out there that's going on in the industry particularly uh, with some of the food companies today is the use of glyphosate as a desiccant it is legal uh, matter of fact there's uh, the, a tolerance of 20 parts per million of glyphosate in an oat crop I don't like it <clears throat> uh, it is essentially doing the same thing to that oat head or to that oat kernel as hitting it with an early frost you are killing the germination you are killing the uh, the cells rupturing some of the cells the farmers that are doing it are doing it to either try to speed up their harvest or they've got a low wet spot in a field that hasn't turned evenly with the rest of the field so they want to try to go straight through with the combine uh, they don't have the option for swathing they're just trying to speed things up a little bit uh, we have a lot of concerns with it even though it's it is legal it's legal in Canada even but uh, we are trying to discourage farmers from doing it or 90 percent of the time when I get a call from a farmer can I do it I'll ask them why and they say well I just wanted to speed up harvest a little bit and I you know generally speaking that's not a good enough reason uh, setting the combine I'll challenge anybody to go grab their combine manual today and look for the setting on oats it's just not there uh, we tell you that if you do have a, uh, uh, a combine that you have some directions on how to harvest malt quality barley or milling quality wheat some of the settings are very similar you want to slow cylinder speed and widen the concave clearances if you're extremely dry if it's a little bit uh, wetter a little bit tougher crop you don't want to dehull that kernel but you can then turn up your fan speed uh, set your concaves and your cylinder clearances a little bit tighter I like to take as much of the grain out of the field as possible it's always possible to clean the oats after you've got it at the bin site we've actually had farmers pay for the operation they'll harvest the oats particularly in a wet year or they want to get the, the crop off of the field they bring it to the bin site they've taken the, the header off of the combine literally run the auger right into the feeder housing at that point in time they have set down the concave clearances tightened up the cylinder a little bit put as much speed on it or on the fan as they can they brought up their test weight two to four pounds in test weight and cleaned out a lot of the thins cleaned out a lot of the chaff out of the oats and then uh, were able to sell a milling quality oat for drying oats the target is between 12 and 13 percent moisture uh, I really encourage bin aeration if at all possible drier temps should be less than 160 degrees Fahrenheit and that means that the grain temperature never gets above 110 degrees if you know anybody that's in the seed business that's the same rules for that you know you, and, and oats are a little bit tough to dry because of that hull 
You need to uh, have a lot of air on the oats. You need to be able to uh, dry the oats down as quickly as possible and then monitor it. Uh, the bottom picture that I'm showing there is a bagger unit and these are gaining a lot of interest around the Midwest today. They've, they've taken over a lot of interest up in Canada. I'm very, very concerned about it. Um, these, you know, I used to call them silage bags when I was growing up. Farmers are now using them at the end of the fields because they can't get trucks fast enough or the combines are so large they can't get the grain away from them. They're using these unloading systems and filling grain in the bags and then leaving them. Now, they're ne they were never designed to be long-term storage. They're designed to be short-term storage. But farmers are leaving them in the ends of the field. And whether they're aerobic or anaerobic conditions, uh, one of the things that we've noticed with uh, farmers that have used them with oats, with barley, and with wheat is the, the varmints, the uh, everything from raccoons to ravens to crows will find that oats bag and shred it because they like the fact that the oats has a little bit more oil content to it than those other crops. And once you open one of those bags up, you've basically got a self-feeder at the end of the field. So um, I, I prefer to see a farmer take good quality or good care of the oats and make some quality product. Uh, put it into a bin where you've got some air and you can uh, do a lot with the oats to improve the quality at that point in time if necessary. So just like with beauty, quality is in the eye of the beholder. We want the farmers to be able to raise a profitable crop, but remember that the milling companies, whether it's for human food or livestock uh, production or pet foods, we're trying to buy an ingredient, and we do have specifications that uh, are necessary to make it a milling quality crop. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. It's, it's, it'll be up on the website. Uh, you can talk to any of our buyers and stuff on it. Again, uh, milling quality oat is based on 38 pounds. Now, when we when we figure out the payment for it, you know, a bushel of oats is 32 pounds, but the spec for purchasing is 38 pounds on a Winchester bushel. We will take it down to 36 pounds, as most of the millers will, with a with a couple cents discount. We have a 13 and a half percent moisture specification. Our target is 13, and again, we really encourage you to have those oats at 13 percent or a little bit lower, because as you get from that 13.5 up to 14 and higher, you do have a chance of those oats going out of condition uh, relatively quickly. The other ones are mostly uh, contamination things, you know, wild oats, wheat, barley, uh, canola. Uh, the thins at 12 percent through a 5 64 by 3 quarter inch. And again, that's something with a good fan, uh, with a good auger system, a grain cleaner, you can clean that up quite well. One-tenth of a percent heat damage is allowed. Again, uh, the most of the heat damage that we see is from somebody that has tried to dry the oats and they've uh, put a little bit too much heat on or they haven't had good air going through those oats. And, of course, no live insects. And test weight conversions, in case anybody isn't familiar with that. So I'll wrap up with the keys to being a strategic supplier to a company like uh, Grain Millers. Understand who the customer is, and our customers are mostly the food companies, the Kellogg's, the General Mills, uh, the Quakers, and those people that want a food quality ingredient. Understand our customers' definition of quality, and we try to pass that on to the producer. And we, and again. You know, we do buy oats directly from producers. We prefer to do that because we see a far better quality than after it's gone through a elevator system or through a grain terminal when it's all blended out. Understand the difference between a crop and an ingredient and those factors that drive the value for the end user. And that's all the way from the seed selection to the way that you handle the oats in the bin. Understand and document your market, your product, and your capability better than your competitors. 
and food purchasing is the most year-round process affecting consumers today and grain marketing should also be a year-round process. I would never encourage a farmer to sell all of their crop in one shot. Uh, you know, sell it uh, two or three times through the year. And there's my contact information and uh, unless there's a couple of immediate questions I'll let Darren take over. Thank you very much Bruce. I'm going to go ahead and pull Darren's presentation up and I see a few questions coming in so we'll stay on the stay on the live mic here and see what pops up. Okay, there's several questions coming in but you know Darren I don't want to um, I want to make sure to leave a lot of time for the end uh, at the end for questions too. So why don't you uh, go ahead and get started, and we'll okay. see what Can comes. Okay. Can you hear me? In. Okay, still. I've got you here. Yep. Okay. Very good, Drake. <clears throat> well, certainly, Bruce. I think you've uh, touched on a lot of really very valid points. Uh, a number of struggles that I run into myself in terms of trying to understand um, what it takes to grow a, a good old crop. Um, by no means I would just share with the group here do I feel like I've got any advantage uh, or <laughs> any understanding that um, is significant. We too have struggled um, to grow good good oats. Um, our yields probably have varied from 130 down to last year which was just you know really quite awful probably in the 50 range um, which surprised us but I think Bruce touched on it earlier is it's largely probably a disease related issue which has us kind of going in a different direction but um, I'll, I'll attempt to quickly kind of give you a background of, of what we've done and what we do. Um, if I can make sure I can get this this uh, slide show to work good. Um, again, this is my family. Just a little bit of background. Um, my wife, Nora, and their five children. Uh, we live near Mallard, Iowa. We've been uh, in organic since 1998. Our crops have been primarily corn and oats. We do some soybeans. Uh, last year we uh, did a foray into, into peas, which was interesting. We do some hay and have struggled with rotations and included flax, uh, popcorn, um, a number of other crops uh, over the years. Kidney beans, just explore and see what works. So today we're about a thousand acres of organic, a little bit more than that. Uh, but we've, we've historically run about 400 <laughs> acres of oats on an annual basis. Um, uh, again, just some, just, uh, some background. Uh, we talked about seeding rates and things like that. I think um, you know, with that, we've tried to push our our um, populations higher, typically because we have been able to run heavy oats, and and uh, if we're running heavy oats and we're seeding heavy oats, um, if it's been run seed, we believe we need to have higher uh, rates out there. So we have tried to push that. Um, typically, we'll set it at 120 pounds or so, and that's typically where we would run that. But uh, just some pictures of our organic farms here. Um, some different fields. Um, Sarah asked, also asked that I would just talk a little bit about rotations in the sense of what we do for cover crops. Um, in this, uh, I'm going to try to turn this on here a little bit if I can. Yeah, there's my pointer. I don't know if this is going to work or not. Yeah, it does. This was actually a hay field. Um, you know, we do a hay, grass, you know, alfalfa grass mix to try to do soil building. Um, you know, sometimes we'll use that in our transition years where we're trying to transition to organic. This field over here is um, uh, a tillage radish, um, some brassica mixes. There's uh, turnips out there. There's some uh, fava beans. There was just a, this was a year we did a, a cover crop. This is planted after our oats are taken off in the summer. Um, planted kind of that late August time frame. Uh, the lower picture down here below actually shows what it looks like a little bit later. Um, you know, as it builds uh, biomass for incorporation later. Um, this we have done some experimenting with flying on cover crops just to try to create soil health um, diversity and that sort of thing. Uh, to be honest, we've had very limited. I feel very limited success with the fly on approach. There's actually, you know, out here there's uh, crop growing in there, but it's not going to make it for anything. There's too much sunlight, especially if you have a good uh, good corn crop. So. Um, that's a little bit of uh, kind of our background there. Obviously, there's challenges each and every year. 
Um, these are pictures from this past year. This is the field to the left here. We had tornadoes and strong winds. Um, fortunately, it was before the crop was too tall. Um, in the upper right-hand corner there, it was a picture of our farms this year. We had uh, 26 inches of rain the last part of June, just got inundated, and um, just lost lots and lots and lots and lots of acres. Um, so this was a tough year for us. And it shows when you look at the, uh, the oat crop then too, where it didn't get drowned out, because of so much uh, leaching, um, our program requires that we put on chicken minute wood as required, but that's what we use as our fertility source. Um, we had a lot of, um, lot of leaching, I think, and just uh, overall loss of nutrients, um, you know, because of all the rain. So, I see Brian put a question. He's getting some background noise. I apologize for that. I'm actually at uh, at Barnes and Noble in Cedar Falls. I did not make it back from a business trip, so I'm going to apologize for that. I hope um, I'll try to shield it a little bit better. Um, just the equipment that we use, <clears throat> um, we do drill presently um, our oats and cover crops. Uh, it's a seven and a half inch Great Plains drill. Um, I would say overall, I like the drill. It's difficult in the spring where there's a wet year and, and getting a drill through wet spots in the field. So it's definitely a, a challenge in that sense. We have uh, used an air seeder to blow them on top. Uh, fuel cultivated them in and then taken a roller and rolled them in and to be honest those have been some of our best yields uh, it, I'm reluctant to do that and actually it's hard to get a, a co-op to come out with an air seeder now and uh, and actually blow those oats on but um, we have gone to the drill and we like the seed spacing and placement we just feel like we get a better job there prior to this year we were running a swather where we actually would um, it's a 25-foot Macdon pull-type swather. Like Bruce said, we feel in some cases it, it helps us even out the oats. We get good uh, test weight, good quality that way. Um, as we grow, it's been a little bit more of a challenge to, to try to get through that with a swather. And um, last year, we did go to uh, just a straight cut. So that's our system right now, is to uh, take a straight cut with, uh, with the uh, draper head. That did really work pretty well from a combining standpoint, and I don't think moisture was an issue. We, we didn't have any issues. But, you know, again, to start off, we were doing a lot of swathing and may need to go back to that. Um, we do try to uh, incorporate our, our oats double in right away most years. Uh, we have done an underseeding with our oats to try to grow a green manure. Again, this is for organic production, but my preference from a weed control standpoint is actually to be able to come in and, and uh, you know, destroy any weeds that are coming at that point in time and uh, give us uh, an opportunity to come back in with a cover crop, a winter pea or something like that to, to build us a little organic matter and, and nitrogen fixation later in the season. I did uh, take an opportunity here just to, to print off what we actually are able to, to generate in terms of a sample Bruce was talking you know, uh, and it, they are an ingredient purchaser, and they are purchasing something from us that needs to be of, of good quality. And this is a sample sheet. This was from actually 2013, um, delivered in September of 13, actually, of that year. Um, so it wasn't too much after harvest, but enough after harvest. If you notice um, down below, you'll see kind of the, the test weight and the specifications. This was 40 pound test weight oats, 1% uh, foreign matter, 12.5% <clears throat> moisture, and, and the thins were 10.8. Um, green Miller's has been really good to work for um, and to sell to. We have pretty much taken all of our organic oats there always. And um, we have had some issues over the years with both, uh, uh, you know, some product being a little light and, and test weight. Uh, sometimes we get there and there will be a live insect. I think there's only one in the entire truck, but they do seem to find that one, and uh, they'll be rejected for that. But uh, we have learned a little bit more in terms of handling efforts to make sure that oh, when it does leave our farm is in the best possible condition to, uh, to uh, meet specifications. And that does involve, you see over here in my grain storage system, 
Um, we do run an air system as much as we can. We have in the past just used a grain vac of pulling from another bin, but um, the cyclone system on an air uh, or a pneumatic system is very effective in, I think, both cleaning out some of the, the light oats as well as um, uh, blowing any bugs out that would be in there. So, you know, that's been really helpful. Something I would certainly recommend as you get an oat crop and have it stored to uh, at least the first two loads out of the bin. Uh, be sure to take those and run them through an air system, just simply because that's where the, the insects seem to to want to be um, in that uh, that time period. And um, if a guy can get them blown out, the lower portion of the bin usually is is usually insect free in our experience. So I do have a, a grain dryer there. You can see um, we do sometimes just combine the oats and run it through the grain dryer real quickly just to take a little bit of the sweat out of them, throw them into an air bin. Um, you know, we're targeting that 12 and a half, uh, 13% moisture when it leaves the dryer. Throw a little more air on it to kind of help uh, stabilize everything and let them sweat out. And uh, we have not had any issues ever with storage, even in, in metal bins. Um, and I, I, I'm going to take a little jab here at Green Millers. This down here in this bottom picture is probably our uh, biggest frustration with oats. Well, I shouldn't say that, Bruce. Um, there's been some challenges in terms of delivery and, and whatnot, and that, that has nothing to do with Bruce. But uh, overall, I would say, um, you know, when you deliver oats to St. Ansgar, which is where we deliver them, um, you know, they are very particular in terms of quality. I would say, um, as a, if you were a food ingredient purchaser, Green Millers, takes food safety as a, as a top priority and, and does a really good job of making sure that you know the plant you deliver to things are clean and um, unfortunately sometimes there's a, a lot of guys there ready to deliver their crop and we have to wait in line so um, I think that addresses most of those storage related issues as I look towards um, my challenges moving forward and and I was able to listen to a little bit of Dave's presentation from last week uh, from Iowa State, and I really think he touched on it. Bruce did as well. The the fungal related issues that that we are facing. I think uh, in my crop rotation, we have tended to stay fairly short. In some cases, it's corn, then oats, and then corn the following year, and then back to oats. And so it's a very tight rotation, works which works really well from a weed control standpoint. But I do think we are creating opportunities. We're getting buildups of some of the fungal uh, related issues um, in our in our uh, fields and that has slowly probably been affecting our yields. Um, the seed treatments um, I'm interested in exploring and I was you know glad to see Bruce talk a little bit about that and I have a question for him here when we're done regarding those. Um, some of the other challenges that I see for us is the timing of our of our manure application. Um, and again for you organic folks out there um, <clears throat> it seems like if we put the manure on in the fall and uh, we plant in the spring with our oats, um, if we've had a lot of snow or a lot of uh, uh, rain early season, you know, in March or so, I think we lose some of our nitrogen, and which is, you know, certainly hurts us down the road. Um, we, for for information purposes, we'll typically shoot for about two ton of chicken litter. Um, prior to, to seeding oats. Sometimes we'll seed those oats or apply that manure right before the seeding in the spring. Sometimes we've done it in the fall. So we still play with that, trying to understand that a little bit. Uh, I talked earlier regarding seeding rates. Uh, again, we're probably in that 120 to 140 pounds uh, is where we, we tend to uh, target. Some of the questions and, and the topics, and Bruce touched a little bit on varieties. We've run um, a lot of Burr oats, uh, we've done uh, some jerry oats a long time ago um, and had good luck with those other than standability issues. Recently we've used a new burr oat that I bought out, in, out of Minnesota and that's been a good oat. It's a little fuller season. Um, but again, our issues typically have not been related to making quality for grain millers. I think we've been able to grow uh, a good quality oat. Um, Yields are not always exactly where we would like to see them, but uh, we're still, lear still learning as we go. Um, so I think I've, I've kind of skimmed through it real quick, and I know I don't want to take a whole lot of time. There may be some questions that come. 
Bruce, are you still on? Yes, I'm on. Well, let Bruce. Uh, Darren, I also see somebody's asking about, or Josh is asking about, yeah, Crown Rust Rust issues last year. Yeah, I mean, you know, and, and it is very evident um, when you get out there to harvest. In some years, you can cut, you can uh, swath those oats, and the and the swather will look pretty clean. And you'll find another year where we'll have. Um, you know, you pick, you know, you'll pick up a lot of rust particulate that that rust dust, if you will. And this year, certainly, we did have it. We were down on oats this year overall um, from our 400 acres because we planted peas, so we had limited exposure. This picture that you see of me combining here, we we had some strong wind right right before we harvested. The oats were looking beautiful, and everything broke over, so it was a little more of a challenge uh, combining, but. Um, I would definitely say that this year the rust component was uh, very severe, very significant, and um, yeah, we we'll probably had a lot to do with uh, you know our yield loss. So, yep. Bruce, I had I, I had some questions. I was going to take you back to your bacterial treatments. Uh, you make mention to that, and I assume that's a seed treatment. Do you care to make reference to what you're referring to? Is that like a mycorrhiza, or is that a um, um, some other sort of treatment that you're using, or what do you refer to there? Well, we're very interested in, you know, what I would loosely call, I guess, Darren, the biological controls that are out there, either applied to the seed, yes, or applied to the standing crop, uh, you know, as a foliar and stuff going forward. There's uh, there's been some snake oil treatments out there, and I'm very leery of those, but at the same point in time, I'm understanding more and more now, particularly in the organic realm, how some of the, uh, some of the materials are using uh, applications of some of the micronutrients along with the, with the biologicals, and they're getting very, very good control that way. So... Uh, I'm hoping going forward here, you know, working with practical farmers and stuff when we do the test plots and stuff this summer, uh, that we can investigate some of that and really understand what the base of some of those compounds are and uh, hopefully be able to try some of them and see if they do have some effect for us. There's a, there's a product in there. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. That's okay. I was just going to bring up that was a great bridge to the question that Alyssa just asked, and uh, that is if there's any sort of data on the economic returns of uh, using those the seed treatments and the and products. I don't have any available today on it. Again, most of the information that I've gotten has been anecdotal from producers, and it varies from year to year, Alyssa, because it you know depends upon whether you've got any disease pressure there in the first place. That's part of the problem of trying to investigate some of these things in a test plot environment. Some years you have a heavier infestation or an infection than you do uh, other years and stuff, so it's really hard to rate it. But going forward here, particularly as we're looking as, at oats from a you know non-GMO crop standpoint, uh, farmers wanting to have a rotational benefit out there, we need to understand this a little bit more and better. Uh, particularly since we've seemed to have lost a little bit of uh, some of our uh, crown rust resistance genes uh, today. Hopefully in another year or two we have some more varieties out there that are, are resistant and uh, we can use those in the trials as well. Great. Hey, Darren, following up on that, how do you feel about sort of at the field level, um, are you seeing sort of the margins big enough where you're thinking about uh, you know, spending the little extra money on these treatments and yeah, I would say <clears throat> we're given an organic premium, and I think you know we tend to look at it a little bit different. It's probably there is the margin there for us to explore that. Um, historically, there's not been a good fungal approach for us. I do know there's a product called Regalia. I don't know if you've heard of that, Bruce. That is um, approved and and maybe a solution for us. I don't have costs on it, so I couldn't speak to the economic um, uh, implications there. But yeah, I would say we definitely are looking at it because there's maybe a little extra margin for us to work with. Great, thanks. Um, 
Bruce and Darren can can uh, answer in here too. There's another question about sort of what's the current oat market like, and I guess uh, maybe if you could expand on that sort of what's it like today, but sort of where are we coming from, and where do you think that we're headed in the in the near future? Um, you know, for 2015, and then even thinking beyond. Well, I've, I'll start off. I'll say, you know, I have to throw in the usual grain buyers disclaimer. You know, last year was last year, and this year is a, is a new year and a different year, and we've got different market dynamics. But I would say there's still a good, strong oat market uh, out there. Uh, we don't have a current old crop bid uh, right now. We, we may have one again, an old crop. I'm referring to the 2014 crop. Uh, just because we're working through some inventories and stuff right now at St. Ansgar. But uh, new crop, as the farmers are thinking about 2015, I would uh, say that uh, today where the, the bid was, uh, and, and I'll, I'll have to put this out as nominal since I'm not able to buy the oats you know, this evening and stuff, we were 60 over the September futures, and I think the September futures closed at 285. So delivered to St. Ansgar for new crop, we would be at uh, about 345 a bushel today for the for the milling quality. And if there's anybody interested in that, uh, you know, they need to contact our buyers up in uh, Eden Prairie, either Jesse Vanderpool, who's on the uh, the webinar with us here. Jesse's number is 952-983-1277 or Sam Razor, 952-983-1311, uh, and uh, they can certainly talk about the specifications, they can talk about pricing and delivery uh, far better than I can. That's great. When, when we think about markets, just to get a little bit to Dave's question, um, can you sort of describe the split between uh, your food market and the feed market, and sort of how those proportions uh, play out? Well, our primary objective, of course, is always the food market. Uh, you know, the, that's the best margins going forward. We do, for farmers that have got maybe some off quality, uh, or they've got some material that they, they just want to move quickly, uh, we do have a trading group up in Eden Prairie. They're always interested in, in uh, looking at your oats and talking to you about the quality on it. And they can generally always place those in with a pet food company or a uh, livestock producer or uh, somebody that's looking you know, for the oats. And those margins really vary. It depends upon the, you know, whether the, uh, how much is available, how close to harvest are you, do they have any <clears throat> general specs, you know, as far as wanting organic or wanting, uh, you know, just conventional feed grade oats or, or what their end use is? So it's really hard, you know, it'd be like trying to nail jello to the wall to give you, you know, some of the price spreads between that. But uh, at any time, you can call one of our buyers and they can tell you what that market is doing. Excellent. Uh, there was another question. Uh, related to how the use of uh, variety mixes as sort of a, a risk management tool against rust and other things. And I'm wondering, Darren, if you've uh, gone with variety mixes in the past? Well, not intentionally. I can't say that we haven't had some uh, mixes just due to uh, our, you know saving back a seed. But I think it's a very interesting concept. I have not researched it, and I have not done that to provide any um, you know good feedback on that. So. That's a, it's a new concept to me. I appreciate the update on it, but no, I have no answer for that. Okay. I know uh, David last week touched on it, and I uh, believe that research report that I posted up will uh, touch on it. I definitely have heard that. Um, I don't know, Bruce, if you could. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll, chime, in. I'll chime in on it, you know, and I'll, I'll chime in on it from two different directions. From an agronomic standpoint, uh, it makes a little bit of sense, particularly if you have a higher yielding variety but you're worried about the standability and you want to get a shorter oat in there to help it stand. Uh, there have been a couple of seed houses in eastern Iowa particularly that have been selling blends of these varieties and I've talked with them in the past on it for the most part a lot of them are fine but again when you start mixing maturities when you start mixing milling quality characteristics with some of these older varieties I really don't like to see that happen from a marketing standpoint or certainly from a milling standpoint 
because you can have oats that appear to start you know lodging and they can still be quite wet uh, because of the varying maturities that you've got in there or differences in the hulling content and this sort of thing so from a miller's perspective if I put my miller's hat on I would say I don't like blending going on that's why we want to try to buy directly from the producer and as little from the elevator lines and stuff as we can because we get a much more uniform uh, mix uh, coming from the farmer again you got to remember the the milling process or oats is a dry milling process we're not making a slurry we're not you know hammer milling these oats we're dehulling the oat we are sizing the groats we are trying to cut those groats after we steam them and you know then we flake them and we need to have some uniformity and consistency because it's essentially a dry milling process when you start blending together a lot of different materials and that's why we have preferred variety lists and we try to identify the variety when we buy them from the farmers so we know how we can mill them to the optimal uh, degree um, from a miller standpoint we like pure varieties from an agronomic standpoint I can see some of the benefits but again maybe you don't want to go to a miller with those maybe you just want to go to the feed market with those oats yeah can, can you give us a sense of what the range of variability would be on different varieties or the range of maturity and so I mean I, it's definitely something to think about if we are thinking about a mix you know try to match match that maturity date that maturity time span you can have five to seven days real easy uh, Drake with the with the uh, uh, you know let's say you take a colt or a spur or something like that an early season from the from the Illinois lines and put them with Newburgh which Darren had this last year or uh, Rockford or one of the North Dakota lines and stuff on it it's not only a difference in the time that it matures it's a difference in the time that that crop dries down and and reaches physiologic maturity this last year we had a relatively cool summer so oats matured a little slower in Iowa than typically what what happens okay great uh, I was a first-time oat grower this year and I felt the same way in terms of I was out there watching them and thinking they'd be there but they just uh, at that those last few days ended up turning into the last uh, you know 10 days watching them watching them mature uh, Sam also has a question uh, just related to uh, spacing and you know says that a lot of times 9 and 10 inches is seen in Canada and it seems narrower is preferable here and th this really builds on a question that we started to think about last week with small grains in general um, and a farmer Dusty Farnsworth was talking about uh, drilling two ways with 15 inch row spacing on his wheat um, and so I'm wondering if uh, Darren given that you've had uh, sort of experience with multiple planters and just change lately if you've got a feeling for um, row spacing and then maybe Bruce can follow that up no, we've, you know, probably historically have stayed more with that solid seated approach. And um, for a number of years, we used, we hired a, the co-op to come out with their Air Max machine and we would spread them on top. So, you know, unfortunately, we were taking a little bit more of the Bruce approach that he was referring to. We, we weren't intentionally doing, uh, trying to plan it and plan it in a, in a perfect way. I think we were probably looking at it as, you know, the, the end gate cedar approach that worked so why can't this work and to be fair we did have really pretty decent success with that um, as long as we were able to lightly incorporate them and then roll them and get a good you know seed to soil contact so I cannot say that I have noticed um, specifically uh, any significant impact regarding sustainability or yield uh, from the times that we have actually used a drill which would be a seven and a half or eight inches um, versus the solid seed so Again, that's something we haven't measured uh, without considering at least there's a lot of other variabilities because of rain or hail or whatever else. So I can't speak to that uh, very accurately as you know as well. I can. Okay, great, thanks. You know, I I gotta throw a pitch out there. I know David uh, Weisberger is is watching, and he was last week's presenter, and a lot of the content that he really focused on was, uh, you know, the need to be. Uh, conscientious and uh, cognizant of planting populations and so you know as we start to talk about different row spacings um, 
really one of the things that we need to keep in mind is is that overall uh, planting population, be it per square foot or per square acre. And so um, I think there's going to be different approaches, and we and we learned that and talked about it last week. Um, as I mentioned, sort of uh, debating seven and a half versus uh, fifteen, and and uh, and really, I, I want to. I know David wouldn't want to say it anyhow, so I'll, I'll, I'll say it as just you know, as we do think about different spacings, think about how that population changes and how um, how, how sort of the plants per inch needs to change in order to make up uh, for that difference in the overall population per acre. Drake, there was some. Uh research done in the last four or five years up in uh, Saskatchewan and of course up there they're pulling some massive tool bars and some massive planting equipment and a lot of interest up there because they're trying to cover more acreage they were really going with some of the you know 12 11 12 inch row spacings and it was discovered that oats are a little bit different than wheat or barley in their reaction to those wide row spacings Number one, the oat with a little bit wider leaf uh, and the fact that it stools out extremely well. When you try to pack the same 18 to 23 plants per square foot into a narrow one row, uh, the oats were stooling a little bit more and that's not always a good thing. You know, the, the tillers that come out on oats helps with yield, but you want that crop to have a, a viable enough root system uh, below to to feed the whole plant. Sometimes those tillers don't mature at the same time as the main plant and stuff. The best results that they were seeing was with the 11 or 12 inch spacing, but they had a two uh, two rows side by side at about two to three inches apart on 11 inch centers, and that allowed a lot better. Uh, spread of the root system, a lot better uh, sunlight absorption of the oat, uh, of that white oat leaf and stuff. The crop looked more uniform and it all seemed to mature at the same time that way. So again, I'm not saying that's always going to be the same thing down in Iowa, but that was the results up in Saskatchewan. Great. I think that's a lot of food for thought and also, um, you know, just proof that we need to be thinking about some of these questions in an Iowa context. And uh, I know PFI has thought about small grains in the past and is doing, uh, has more plans for the future. But like I said, I think that's just, uh, that comment there is just proof that uh, that research is, is much needed, um, especially as we, you know, try to make Iowa farmers more successful with, with uh, oats. Um, and Darren, you can feel free to go ahead and answer that question uh, via audio if that works out. And that's, um, oh, you already did it. Sam asked if uh, you followed uh, grass with brome, and um, Darren said, you know, not a lot of uh, experience with that. I know, you know, Bruce sp spoke earlier about sort of uh, grasses following with grasses, and I know uh, we're thinking about how to plan for, for successful oats, but I don't know if, Bruce, if you have any insight on uh, planting a grass following oats and how that might affect establishment or not. Uh, not a lot of experience in that. Obviously, oats, for instance, up in Wisconsin, oats is still the preferred companion crop to get a good legume going, again, because it helps choke out the, the, uh, the uh, weed pressure and stuff early in the uh, legume's growing cycle and stuff. But I really don't have a lot of experience of of you know putting a brome in or something like that uh, with the oat, I, I'm not sure if you know if there's any antagonistic effect there or if it works well as a companion or not. Okay, excellent. Um, and I see we're getting close to our 8:30 time slot, so I want to give uh, Bruce and Darren both an opportunity to offer any any closing thoughts if they'd like. So uh, since Bruce, if you were up, if you'd like to. If you have any closing thoughts for us, no, I would, uh, and for folks interested, I would just encourage farmers to uh, you know consider uh, oats as a viable rotation crop. Um, I think it's there's a lot of uh, things that we're learning about the oat crop. Again, the benefits of it is a rotation crop. The fact that it can help reduce some of the uh, uh, insects that are bothering soybeans or or corn. I think the fact that it's helping with disease suppression. The fact that it's a deep-rooted uh, crop and, and will help mine uh, some of the uh, carryover nitrogen and stuff that we've got in some of the Iowa soils. I think there's a lot of good reasons to have oats in a rotation. 
And if they've got any further questions, by all means, you know, my uh, my information's out there. I'd be happy to answer it uh, for pricing and stuff. You know, give our Eden Prairie office a call, and uh, we'll line them up with a buyer that'll discuss varieties and everything else with them. All right. Thank you very much, Bruce. And uh, I hope folks take you up on that. Like you said, a, a wealth of knowledge there, and we sure appreciate uh, the time tonight um, to share some of that knowledge with us. Great content. Um, and Darren, uh, any final thoughts? Not really. I, I would say, though, I, I really do appreciate Pro Far or Practical Farmers' um, approach to trying to, to research this, and certainly uh, David Weisberger as well. Um, I've now got a chance to, to work with him one-on-one uh, -on, -one on some of this stuff here. We've talked over the phone, but I know they've done a lot of research as well, and I, I, I'm excited to see the effort putting forth, uh, being put forth to kind of help um, uh, educate us and you know, like we said earlier I think there's a lot of knowledge that's out there it's just kind of been lost through the years so I think there's there's good things that are happening I'm excited to see uh, what feedback other farmers can um, uh, you know can come up with as, as we continue to explore this and, and my hope is that we can grow you know great oats in Iowa and not just you know kind of average oats so again thank you for you guys' efforts as well Well, thank you very much, Darren, and I agree. A lot of knowledge has been lost, and we're going to try to do uh, our little bit to help preserve some of that knowledge and to keep the enthusiasm uh, going for not only oats, but uh, all small grains. And so as we draw to a conclusion tonight for our farm and our, I want to uh, make sure to remind everybody that this will be archived on our website uh, within the next day or so. Um, and also that there's other small grain related content uh, in, from past farm and ours and uh, pending farm and ours. And so I'd encourage you to, to look back at the archives. I know in the fall we had a session with uh, Iowa farmer Dick Sloan, an Iowa State researcher looking at extended crop rotations. Matt Lehman uh, talked about working small grains into rotation. Uh, last week we had um, you know a similar conversation focused on uh, success with small grains. We talked to some beginning farmers, some experienced farmers, and uh, David Weisberger from Iowa State. And the next week, at the same time, Tuesday at 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m., we will be talking about uh, stand evaluation in cereal rye uh, with researcher Greg Roth of Penn State and uh, farmer Tim Syrian of Iowa, who started uh, ex his first experiences with cereal rye were as a cover crop. Uh, and then after several years of success, uh, he decided to just go ahead and grow his own uh, cover crop seed. So he now is using cereal rye as a cover crop. Um, and as a seed source, and then also selling a little bit of extra seeds. So uh, we look forward to your participation uh, next week, and we thank you for your participation this week. Thank you very much to Darren Fair and Bruce Roskins, uh, a great source of, of knowledge. I hope we can keep this uh, conversation going, and I appreciate the strong attendance tonight. Uh, thanks very much, and Look forward to seeing you again on the next Practical Farmers of Iowa Thank you, Drake. Farm and R.